So, uh, hi everyone, uh, sorry for the waiting. And uh, I'm Chong Ji Chen, and thank you very much for uh, joining today's FinWeb workshop. And uh, I will first uh, provide an overview of uh, this year's FinWeb, and uh, then we'll go to the presentation part. So uh, first of all, I want to thank our uh, program committee. They provide much help with uh, paper selection and provide comments. And uh, second, uh, here are the statistics of our participants. And uh, participants come from eight countries and uh, 13 institutions, and from both, uh, as you can see, from both uh, academic and industry. And uh, here is today's program. Uh, for each paper, I will play uh, the pre-recorded video, and then we'll have about five minutes for a QA session. And uh, then uh, we'll have about yeah five minute QA session. Then uh, please put uh, questions to message box during the presentation and uh, the presenters can prepare for the question during the presentation. So uh, here is today's program and uh, we'll have a short break at uh, a, uh, five o'clock in Japan. And uh, this is the, uh, in, please check in your time long. And uh, finally, I want to share some related event with you and uh, this year, uh, in NLP workshop will become a twice a year event. And uh, thus in July, it will be collocated with EduCAD. And in December, it will be collocated with uh, ENLP. And every year we propose interesting tests in both uh, in NLP and uh, NTCL. So uh, this year, there are two short tests in, in NLP at each kind, including a learning semantic similarity for the financial domain. And, and the other short test is document layout analysis. So uh, if you are interested in uh, FinTech and NLP, uh, please join us. And uh, we will we also propose a short test in uh, fin NLP at EMNLP, and it's based on uh, is based on our papers uh, in last year's the web conference and which is about investors rational analysis. So uh, please join us and you can leave your uh, email address to us for updating the news of this event and via this QR code or uh, the link. And uh, here I want to uh, highlight the new idea this year. And uh, we prepared a showcase for AI in FinTech papers. And you can share your paper in uh, this form and uh, we will provide an overview every year. And this year we will share the overview in uh, FinLP at ENLP. And uh, let me show you the, uh, the form we prepared. Uh, this is the form. Uh, you can uh, fill this form uh, to uh, like the titles and link to your paper and your publication. And uh, if you, you're willing to do that, you can provide uh, many information for uh, readers uh, that are interested in AI in FinTech. And uh, the more information you provide, uh, the more easier that uh, others can uh, find your papers. And uh, and the uh, submitted information will show in uh, this this Google document. And uh, so uh, everyone who interested in uh, AI in fintech can uh, get the information from this this form. And uh, they can further like uh, use the information submitted to uh, like construct the website like ACL ontology. And so uh, please try to uh, try to use this phone and provide any suggestions to us. 
And uh, so uh, let me explain why uh, we have this uh, idea. Uh, because during the preparation of tutorials uh, at uh, AACL 2020 and EMLP 2021, we find that we need to uh, restore the title and abstract of all accepted paper in different uh, conference like ACL, EMLP, AAAI, like that. But uh, we, we, we just want to show out the related papers uh, uh, related to AI in FinTech. And uh, there are, at least I, uh, to the best of my knowledge, I, I, I don't find any uh, good place to uh, that already show out all of the related papers. So uh, we want to provide a way to collect the research related to AI in FinTech. So uh, we believe that in uh, this process is more uh, convenient for all researchers and uh, could save their time. So uh, the researchers who fill out the form can also uh, advise their work. And in our opinion, this is a win-win idea. So uh, as I say, uh, we will summarize and provide the, the uh, we will summarize and provide a brief brief talk uh, based on the paper in this showcase every year in FinNLP or uh, FinWeb or uh, we may support a tutorial to somewhere. And uh, in this way, I, I, I believe that uh, participants can get an overview of recent AI in FinTech studies. So uh, this year we will provide a talk in FinNLP at ENLP in December. So uh, please try to up upload the information about your work to this, this place and uh, feel free to provide suggestions to me. And uh, the more, as I say, the more information you provide, the more likely people will see your work. So uh, you can also add the related work you read to share the information with other researchers. So uh, please try to use that and uh, we'll keep uh, updated. So, uh, thank you for your attention and let's start today's workshop. So uh, here's the first talk, so uh, let's start. Hi everyone, I am Jingxiang from DBS Bank in Singapore. On behalf of my team, I will be sharing on how the bank improved our operation efficiency through predicting the turnaround. Sorry, I just want to check could uh, everyone hear the sound? Yes, okay, great, thank you. Time of the credit card application process with index-based encoding. Now the credit card application process is a complicated one and in the research literature, this falls under complex business process modeling. It is complex because each application process has different steps, sequence and duration. So for example, an application can be submitted online or via physical bank branches the customer may apply for different credit card products with uh, different documents like the passport or driving licenses and different customers will have different credit ratings and so on. So turnaround time here refers to the duration from when an application is submitted to when the application for the credit card is either approved or declined. It is in the interest of the bank that turnaround time is shortened to improve our customer experience and to increase the operation efficiency. Now, there are three different business objectives. First, we want to predict the turnaround time for ongoing credit card applications with a machine learning model. The keyword here is ongoing. Next. From the model, we want to identify the top drivers of prediction using feature contribution or feature importance. And finally, 
depending on whether these thought features can or cannot be acted upon, we want to proactively intervene on selected applications to potentially reduce the turnaround time. As an example, if an application X is predicted to take longer due to incomplete address and the customer has no other existing relationship with our bank that can be used to figure out the address, we can recommend and prompt the relationship managers to reach out to the customer to, to find out. So moving on to the problem formulation, the supervised machine learning model being used for this project is XGBoost and the labor or dependent variable that we are predicting is the remaining turnaround time. Evaluation metrics being used would be the mean and median absolute error. Now for the input features, this can be split into static, dynamic and last state features. So static features are available at the start of the application and they remain constant throughout the application process. For example, this includes whether the customer is new to the bank, how did the customer submit the application, is it via an online portal or by mail, and which day of week was the application submitted on, is it a Friday or Monday, and so on. Post-processing, static features are one-hot encoded and there are about 100 static features. Dynamic features are information added or generated throughout the application process. For example, this includes the step description, whether the application is at the credit, fraud or operations department, and the time duration at each of these departments and so on. Post-processing, the dynamic features are labeled and coded and there are about 700 dynamic features. For last step features, these are basically the last known step of the dynamic features and these are also labeled and coded. One key consideration is the requirement to predict the remaining turnaround time at any point in time throughout the application process. This means that when new information is available, the prediction can be refreshed and can be more accurate. So this requirement leads us to index encoding where there can be static features such as the application profile that does not change throughout the journey or dynamic and last state features that are derived as the application progresses on. So this includes information and time taken for each step. Suppose this application has n number of steps along the timeline. So over here we have step 1, step 2, step 3, all the way to step n. The prediction can be made at any point in between the steps. Assuming that the point of prediction is over here, so the application profile and the first 5 steps over here will be the input data for the model to predict the remaining turn around time over here. So whenever there is new information from the journey itself, the point of prediction will shift to the right. So there is more input data on the left and this data will be used to predict the remaining turnaround time. Over here we have a little bit more details on the specifics of index encoding. In this table we have two different applications from two different customers. The first three row, rows with blue cells are from one customer. Each row represents a new update at different points in time. Now, we can see that the static features remain the same throughout the three updates. For simplicity, only two static features are shown over here. For dynamic features, only one dynamic feature, which is the step description, is shown here for simplicity. We see that the first row of the first update has six steps, while the second and third row have seven and nine steps, respectively. The number of steps is kept at 99 steps to reduce complexity 
as ninety eight percent of the applications have less than ninety nine steps for the last state features this is simply the last known steps of the dynamic variables now the prediction of the turnaround time can be made at the first update or the first row and it can be refreshed with every new update or additional row one benefit of using index encoding is that the symbolic sequence of each application can be captured as compared to other types of encoding another benefit is that as the application progresses on the incremental information generated during each step can be used to generate a more accurate prediction of the remaining turnaround time now let's move on to the modeling part there are two key considerations that we had now the first is the trend of the average turnaround time and this is a critical factor for example the turnaround time may trend higher or lower due to seasonality or improvement in the business process therefore heavier sample weights were given to more recent applications during the training of the machine learning model now the second factor that we had in consideration is the possibility of biasness when an update is cross-validated against another update from the same application therefore a predefined split for cross-validation is used to ensure that updates from the same application are assigned to the same validation flow over here these are the XGBoost parameters that were tuned during the training of the machine learning model a total of 10 cross validation folds were used now on the right hand side we have a simplified architecture diagram of the solution that we implemented let's move on to the performance evaluation mean absolute error or MAE is used to measure the performance of the machine learning model we have a MAE of 0.97 day for the out of sample test set this is also reflected as experiment 1 in the table below for production data that was back tested we see similar level of performance for experiment 2 we took out index encoding so only static features and last state features were used we see a big deterioration in performance from 0 0.97 the error became 2.37 day so this implies that index encoding has a strong impact on the model performance for experiment 3 we took out the last state encoding so only static and dynamic features were used and there is a slight drop in performance this shows that having last state features is helpful lastly for experiment 4 we took out the sample weights for data that are more recent and again the performance is lower now the chart on the top right hand corner is a plot of prediction error versus the number of application updates basically this is a way of verifying that as more information is added to the application in the form of updates the prediction becomes more and more accurate as the prediction error drops so we know that index encoding is working over here instead of mean absolute error we have the median absolute error in the table below it can be seen that the median error is a lot lower than the mean error the reason is because the error distribution is a long tip one an investigation was done to understand applications that falls under the long tail 
it was discovered that the model is unable to predict the response time of customers to the bank. For example, when contacted for more information, some customers may reply on the same day, while others may take a, a week or two to reply. Now, the model is unable to predict for this variance, and this leads to applications that fall under the long tail. Therefore, median absolute error is also an important performance evaluation indicator for our project. Now, let's move on to model explainability and follow up actions. This is the last slide, and we want to explain how the prediction can be used. Sharply values from game theory is used to quantify the contribution of features. The top features include the duration of critical early steps, as well as the number of discrepancies in the applications. Certain features can be used to improve the business process. For example, we found that applications submitted on Fridays take a longer time to be processed because these applications are processed along with applications that are submitted over the weekends on Monday itself. Another example is that applications submitted through the physical bank branches take a longer time to be processed as compared to applications that are submitted online. Now, this corresponds with knowledge on the ground and their relative significance in predicting the turnaround time provides incentive for the business to allocate more resources or to fine-tune the business process. Lastly, at the application level, with the prediction of the remaining turnaround time, the relationship manager can proactively intervene on selected applications based on the top contributing features, whether this can or cannot be acted upon to potentially reduce the turnaround time. As mentioned earlier, reducing, reducing the turnaround time translates to better customer satisfaction and better operation efficiency. So with that, I conclude the presentation and thank you for listening. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I wonder whether uh, any participant have questions to uh, this paper. We can take some questions. So, uh, if no, uh, I have one question. Uh, I, I wonder if the proposed method is already used in the, uh, like if you're in house system for some, like the application you mentioned. Uh, hi, so I'm the author of the, the paper. So the model is really implemented in our current in house. So it has been productionized. Oh, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, if if uh I, I have one more question. Uh have you tried like some neural network models and how's the performance? Uh, so the current model is our MVP one. So for MVP two, we are looking to try our STM. Yeah. Yeah. I so we, we will be trying the, the uh, STM model for the next iteration. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now, uh, any questions from participants? Okay. Yeah. Thank you for your presentation and uh, answering. And uh, let me share the uh, showcase I mentioned with you. Uh, you can use that link to take a look. And uh, maybe if you are interested, please uh, fill the, the form. And so uh, let's... Uh, Going to the next presentation. Hello, my name is Naoto Minagawa from the University of Tokyo. Today, I'm going to present graph representation running on banking transaction network 
with edge weight enhanced tension and texture information. Here's the contents of today. First, we will introduce the background and previous work of this research, and then we discuss proposed methods. And then we will discuss experiments, including data sets and results, and then finally move on to discussion. So here's the introduction. First, uh, we will present motivation to build a transaction network. So building a network from transaction data is effective to extract important information from the data. So this diagram illustrates uh, sometimes the counterpart, uh, counterparty, which is not the immediate counterparty, could be more important to a specific counterparty. In this example, company A uh, do the transaction with different companies. They have immediate companies, uh, immediate counterparties who send or receive large amount of money like company B and E, while they uh, have transaction with small amount with company D and F. In this case, if company B and E have a different counterparty who send or receive huge amount of money, which is company X and Y in this case, this company could be more important to company A than company D, which is the immediate counterparty of company A. So to capture this kind of intercompany relationship, uh, building a network is pretty effective. So recent advances in the area of deep learning on graphs, uh, we can capture more complex information from this kind of technique. So basically what this is doing is to obtain the embeddings of nodes that represent information about each account and then considering the intercompany relationship. So this uh, illustration is about the prediction of transaction occurrence. For example, this yellow uh, link is basically to predict if there is a link between two companies. So by using the graph neural nets, we consider the network topology and also the uh, node features, and then we try to predict if there is a link. So the graph neural network has wide range of um, application domain. So including like protein interface prediction, side effects prediction, among others. Especially for financial domains, um, the application includes stock movement prediction, loan default risk prediction, fraud detection, and so on. In our research, we particularly interested in uh, transaction prediction. The most similar work to our research is listed as follows. So for example, uh, Fujitsuka et al. 2019 did the transaction prediction using the node to back and also the traditional network analysis method to predict the uh, transaction between uh, companies. Different research is uh, by KZN 20, 2019. This is to get the merchant embeddings from the credit card transaction by formulating the bipartite graph of the credit card transaction and the land embedding of accounts and margin. And then finally, previous work by uh, Simovskaya 2021st is to predict the uh, um, transaction and also application to credit scoring. They leverage concepts from the graph neural nets like GCN, GAT, and SEER, and then they focus on temporal characteristic appearing in the banking transaction data. So in this research, our focus is use of sector information and transaction amount on top of network topology. So we are moving on to the proposed method. So we introduced the three novelties to efficiently extract information from banking transaction network. First is to, to use the textual information as node feature. This is to introduce the similarity of bank accounts. And then we propose the Nobel edge attention mechanism to consider accounts and transaction amount equally. And then we will also use the graph isomorphism network to get the more expressive bank accounts representation. Entire network design to extract the information um, is as follows. So first, we construct the banking transaction network 
with sector embeddings as node features. And then we apply GAT with edge enhanced attention mechanism, and then further apply GIN to obtain the node embeddings. Using resulting node embeddings, we predict the transaction occurrence with the graph auto encoder. To obtain node embeddings, we use the doc 2 back which is a sentence embedding method similar to word 2 back So word 2 back basically predict the uh, from context word to a specific word or vice versa. So they have two variations of model. In the doc 2 back similar to word 2 back consider additional paragraph vector to predict the specific words or vice versa. The pipeline to obtain node future is as follows. Uh, this is the original texture information about a particular bank account. And then we apply cleansing of irregular characters, stemming lemmatization, and removal of stoppers to tokenize the word. And then apply doc to deck to finally get the D dimensional vector as node feature. Using this D dimensional vector as node feature, we construct a banking transaction network. Specifically, we place a texture embedding of the sector information about the bank account, and then we place the aggregated transaction amount on the edges. Please note that node feature dimension is much greater than edge feature dimension in our setting. And then we regard this situation can appear generally when we construct the financial transaction network. And then we will move on to the graph attention network. Graph attention network is defined as follows. Basically, uh, aggregate the weighted, attention weighted node, uh, neighbor node features as this equation. And an attention score is calculated by the concatenation of a node and the neighbor nodes, multiplied by a weight vector applied to Ricky Redu and the softmark function. And then finally, apply activate function to aggregate the node feature. In the original GAT in previous slides, it doesn't consider the edge features. To resolve um, this issue, Chen et al, um, in their previous work, uh, proposed the um, edge enhanced attention mechanism. Basically, what this is doing is on top of concatenation, of the node features. They further concatenate the edge feature to determine the importance of neighbor nodes. However, in our settings, as we saw in the construction uh, of the banking transaction network, the dimension of node feature is much greater than the edge features. So in this setting, uh, the edge features contributes little in terms of dimension. To resolve these issues, we first reduce the dimension of node features and then sum the edge feature uh, as a scalar value, like uh, in this equation. To introduce this, we can consider our node features and edge feature in well-balanced fashion. And then uh, graph isomorphism network. Graph isomorphism network is uh, invented to maximize the expressive power of node embeddings. Similar to other uh, message passing framework, they aggregate the neighbor node features and apply MLP to weight the sum of node and neighbor nodes in this formula. In original paper, they use the one hot encodings as a node feature. However, in our case, we apply multiple uh, MLP, extra MLP to enhance the expressive power of the network. So this is discussion um, about the motivation to use the textual information. So we use the sector embeddings as a node feature. Indeed, this is less effective than one hot encodings in terms of injectivity, because the number of industrial sector is less than the number of, uh, of accounts. On the other hand, our sector embeddings can introduce the similarity of accounts. In this case, company A is processed meat company, B is milk products company, and C is automobile company. By using sector embeddings, we can learn the nuances like A and B should be embedded across, 
as they are both in food industry while slightly different. On the other hand, C should be embedded far from the A and B because it's automobile industry. However, in one hot encodings, it just simply distinguish A, B, C without considering the similarity. By using uh, resulting embedding after applying gene, so we use a graph hot encoder to predict the uh, linkage between companies. So what graph hot encoder is doing is uh, taking the um, dot product of the node embeddings and apply the sigma function to determine the uh, transaction prediction. So here's the experiment. Regarding the data sets, data set is provided by one of large agent banks with all the data in depersonalized format. So first is the monthly aggregated transaction. This illustrates company A sent company B 1 million in a particular month. And then corresponding account description is originally obtained from the agent central bank mapped with each account by the data provider bank. And then table three represents the basic information about the constructed network. So this indicates there is over uh, 1,700 nodes, uh, bank accounts in the network. And then the linkage between uh, accounts is more than 1 million. As for experiments, we adapted link prediction task uh, and then we evaluated by ROC AUC score, which is standard practice. So we compared different baseline methods. So the comparison between the shallow embedding methods, we uh, actually used the node feedback with the GNN, is the use of node future. So this is basically to see how effective to consider sector information on top of network topology. As for the comparison between GNNs and proposed methods, it's to see uh, edge enhanced attention mechanism and also the network design. For implementation and other experiment details, uh, please see the paper. And then finally, discussion. So this table shows the uh, results of the experiment. As shown, uh, ROC LEC score marked the highest in the proposed methods. And then when we compare node to back with the GNN baseline models, we see the effect of the considering texture information. And then when we compare proposed methods versus the GNN baseline methods, um, we see the um, ROC score is higher, and then we can confirm the efficiency of the normal edge attention mechanism and also the network design. As a summary, we introduced the three novelties. So considering similarity of bank accounts by introducing the node features, and also the novel edge enhanced attention mechanism and the use of GIN to get the more expressive bank accounts. To prove this efficiency, we conducted experiments and then demonstrate the better performance in link prediction tasks. As a future work, um, we will consider refinements and applications. Due to data limitation, we just use the sector embeddings. However, by adding more uh, texture data to the each account, we can make the bank account representation unique. And then we are also considering to use modern NLP models such as BERT instead of Dr. Beck, and then conduct more experiments to demonstrate the detailed comparison between different methods like SEER and the existing edge enhanced attention mechanism. And then we also consider our applications to downstream tasks, such as stock price prediction, macroeconomic indicator predictions, and the credit scoring. So here's the end of our presentation and thank you very much for your attention. So uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, any questions from participants? I think you can open your mic and ask questions directly. Any question? 
Okay, uh, let me ask the first question. Uh, as, as you mentioned uh, in, in the future work that uh, like you can use bird instead of document back. Uh, I wonder have your team still exploring this direction uh, uh, because the embedding like bird have performed well as, as you say for several years. So uh, do you have any some new findings to share with us like the result with bird? Hi, thank you for your question. Yeah, definitely. Um, I'm working on uh, replacing the Dr. B, uh, Dr. Beck uh, part with the, the bot model, but like uh, I'm just uh, continuing the experiment. So I have yet to have the results yet. Yeah, so the reason uh, why I use Dr. Beck is just simply because that was like an older model. Uh, I knew like a body is more like a state of the art, close to state of the art and the modern standard of like to getting those kind of like embedding. But um, it was just like a simply because like Dr. Beck was older model. So I wanted to start from the the baseline and then wanted to check if the bird works uh, better in this context. So, yeah, so it's under uh, yeah. the experiment right now. I see, I see. because uh, I see from your uh, from in your experiment that the performance is already very high. So mm. uh, I just wonder uh, how, how's the performance of work. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, uh, anyone have questions? Okay, well, we have, uh, is the data set accessible? Uh, have you published the data set? Mm. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you for the question. Actually, our data set was provided by uh, one of the large Asian banks, but like uh, it was some, uh, we made some kind of like contract to do this experiment. So it, it, it is kind of like a private data because it includes some of the information about the company. So um, I don't think it's uh, possible to make the data public because like that's owned by uh, the the bank. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I think so. Because uh, actually, I think in financial domain, the data is also very sensitive as uh, like mm -hmm. in uh, like biomedical domain. So uh, yeah, it's reasonable that this kind of data is not publishable. Yeah, uh, any other question? Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, if, if uh, there are no other questions, I, I have uh, one, maybe not question, but suggestion for your application is that uh, we have published a work uh, that called implicit re recognition because uh, I think that uh, the tra transaction that how you use is helped for uh, like capturing the apps upstream and downstream relationship. So uh, last year we have a paper in ESL and uh, this paper is attempt to link the relationship between companies. So uh, maybe this kind of text can, uh, can be used in uh, for your next step. So uh, let me share that with you. So uh, if you have, if you are interested in this, uh, please. Yes, I'm interested. Uh, welcome for, Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. Welcome for this question. And uh, any other questions? Okay, so uh, if not, uh, I have one more question. Uh, I wonder, uh, because actually there are many uh, like company embedding methods and uh, they try to construct company embedding based on some like news or other uh, public file data set. And uh, have you tried that or uh, will try to uh, use some uh, like public data to compare with uh, this kind of, uh, for example, to compare the performance uh, with the proposed model and uh, using some like this kind of private data set? Yes, thank you so much for your question. Yeah, I think it's a very good question. The motivation of my research is kind of like try to do some kind of fusion of the like a, the numerical data, like transaction amount, and also to introduce some kind of similarity 
of the, the bank account. So that could be applicable for each company or maybe for each sector. So in some sense, what I was wondering is kind of like a, if we can do, uh, what do you call it? Like there's in economics, there's some kind of like an input output model that is like a between sectors, how much amount is transferred. So I, I was wondering that could be this kind of like alternate using alternative data, um, if that kind of approach could be possible to to effectively capture the state of uh, economic right now. So in some sense, when when uh, this could be also a kind of like a future work uh, written in application, but when it comes to like a downstream task, maybe the uh, the best embedding method for maybe capturing the uh, economics between the company or uh, economy between the sector. So in 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 that case, uh, when when I actually do apply this method for the downstream task, as you mentioned, uh, comparing with different kind of like embedding method uh, is very uh, interesting, and then that's definitely on my list. Thank you so okay. much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And. Uh... Thank you. And uh, I think it's time to go into the next presentation. So uh, thank you for your presentation and answering. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, in this talk, I'll present our paper titled Understanding Financial Information Seeking Behavior from User Interactions with Company Filings. Uh, my name is Mojda Aryan Nejad. I'm a PhD student at AI for Retail Lab or Air Lab at University of Amsterdam. And this is a collaboration uh, with my colleagues, Mohamed Yahya, Edgar May from Bloomberg, and my supervisors, Sebastian Shelton and Martin Drake from University of Amsterdam. So let me start with an introduction. As a first question, uh, we want to answer is what is a financial filing? Um, so a, a financial filing is a document, a financial a statement um, related to a company uh, and uh, which is usually made by the parties tied to these companies. Here in this example, you are, uh, uh, you are seeing a, a filing of type 10Q which is a quarterly report on, on a company. So a filing has different attributes. So it, it is uh, related to one company, in this case, Amazon, and has a filing dates where, when have this filing been submitted and uh, an identifier uh, of, the, of this specific filing. So this is also uh, from the same filing. It, it can, uh, in this case, this, this part of the filing contains uh, a table about the cash flows of uh, Amazon in a, in a specific uh, quarter. Um, and there are other also financial matters that could be present in a financial file. Um, so US-based uh, publicly traded companies are required to submit uh, this financial filing to a to, to a system called uh, to, to Securities and Exchange Commission uh, to, via a system called uh, EDGAR, which is an abbreviation for EDGAR Electronic Data Gathering and Retrieval System, which is used uh, by uh, public or by user, by anyone to access uh, the submitted filings. So a user uh, can go to this EDGAR uh, website and uh, look for uh, it, a filing and find the information they need and just uh, read the document, basically. Um, so a user can do this uh, or find the filing and access the filing via different approaches on Edgar. One is company lookup to look for the company that they are interested in and then browse the filing of the interest of that company. And then there is also full text search so looking specifically for the information that uh, that they in in form of a text and a filing and also there are ways to view the latest filing that have uh, have been submitted to the system here is an example of uh, what this uh, what this uh, interface edgar interface looks like in, in here we observe that um, a, a user can go up 
to the system and search for Amazon, for example, in this case, and by clicking on the results of the search, in this case, uh, the first result, they will be redirected to a page containing all filings of that uh, particular company uh, with, with their different attributes. So form type, filing date, and then by clicking on, on the description itself, they will see the content of the filing. Um, so uh, the SEC has made publicly available a large data set, which we call here Edgar Log File Set or Edgar LFT, that uh, records the accesses to this filing from 2003 to 2017. So every access to Edgar to the filings have been recorded in this data set. And each record in the data looks like uh, these examples that I have given here which contains of a hashed IP address, a date and a time for the access, uh, where this access is initiating from or the refer, and an identifier which, uh, which shows which filing is being accessed. Um, and uh, this data set is uh, the access records and what we do as an initial step is grouping these uh, individual accesses into sessions of accesses by users. Uh, we have the details of how we do this in the paper. Some statistics about this data set. It is quite large with more than uh, 11 million uh, unique, filing, unique filings in total that come from more than 600,000 companies. We also observe an increase in the number of daily, average number of daily accesses and daily users in, in the data sets from 2003 to 2017, which shows that this data, this uh, system is, uh, is gaining more attention and, uh, uh, and, uh, and there is a growth in the number of both users and accesses in general. Um, what we do in this paper is threefold and I uh, will uh, go, uh, I just described one and I will go over the rest, the rest of it in this talk in, in, in short. Uh, first of all, we provide a detailed description and uh, statistics for this uh, Edgar LFD or Edgar Log file data set. So this will guide and inform anyone who is interested in exploring this data set further, further uh, and we, we then provide uh, an analysis on an information seeking behavior of Edgar users. Uh, this is done through uh, explore, explorative analysis says, which are described in the paper. We further identify two different types of filing recommendation as a downstream task uh, that can be that can correspond that corresponds to different users patterns that we observe in Edgar, and uh, we we basically set the scene for follow up research on this filing recommendation task. I'll start with a peek into the user behavior analysis that we have done in the paper. Uh, on a user level, uh, we looked at like uh, okay where or how many uh, sessions do we have uh, for specific users in, in the system. Uh, this figure here shows the proportion of sessions based on the proportion of no users in, uh, in the data set. We observe an interesting uh, fact that um, the 10% the 10 most active users on Edgar are uh, accounting for roughly 75% of the sessions. So we have a small number of uh, users which are responsible for most of the accesses uh, that is being done um, via Edgar to the filings. Uh, we, we, we further distinguish between these uh, top active users as frequent users and uh, all users in general. Uh, in another experiment, we look at the number of companies that users are interested in uh, and the distribution of that. This figure here shows the cumulative distribution of user companies uh, for both uh, all users and for frequent users. What we are seeing here is that um, 
in general, all users and more particularly frequent users are only concerned with a uh, very small number of uh, companies and a small subset of all companies that have their filings available on uh, on on SEC website and uh, they they are like during their lifetime they go over a very very small percentage of all the companies that are uh, that have uh, filings on Edgar. In another experiment, we look at uh, the number of companies per session. So we look at the sessions, and he this figure here shows the uh, shows the mm, community distributions of companies per session. And again, we observe that most sessions are focused on a small number of companies. So you don't really have uh, commonly a session that contains filing from uh, a lot of companies. So specifically, we observe that like 66% of all sessions contain filing for or even one or two companies and not more. So these are some examples of, uh, of the explorative analysis that we have done in this uh, data set. As a, as a downstream task that can be informed by this by these filings and can uh, and can be done uh, with this uh, information, we look at filing recommendation. So let me motivate uh, this selection of problems. So first of all, we we know that there are um, on average more than three thousand filings being submitted per day uh, to the system. Uh, which means that like Edgar users are overwhelmed with this amount of information that is becoming available to them. And as a, uh, as, as a, an, a filing recommendation system can basically uh, help these users by reducing the burden on them uh, to navigate the filings and it will facilitate quick, quicker access uh, to the filings overall. Um, based on the observations that we have in the first part, uh, we identified two uh, types of recommendation that can be uh, can be uh, used uh, on Edgar. So one is next filing recommendation. By next filing recommendation, uh, I mean that we're given an ongoing session. Uh, which is not completed yet, we want to recommend the next filing to be uh, read by, by the user on this ongoing session. So this will be uh, most suitable for infrequent users on Edgar for which we do not have access to previous history. And if you recall from before, a lot uh, and the majority of the users of Edgar are this type of infrequent users without any previous history. And at the same time, there are uh, there is another uh, recommendation task that we identify, which we call next session recommendation. So the, the goal of this type uh, of recommendation is to recommend a full list of uh, filings for a user to be viewed by them in their next session. So this is again, uh, particularly useful for the frequent users of Edgar, the ones that are a minority of users but are at the same time very important because they account for a lot of uh, accesses in the data sets for them we do have a rich history that we can use for predicting the uh, next uh, sessions of filing to be viewed um and uh, we, we 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 provide some uh, uh ideas for these recommendation tasks uh, under a two-stage recommendation scheme. Um, if we recall from our observations, we saw that, okay, the users themselves uh, are only concerned with a small number of companies during their uh, uh, interactions uh, with Edgar. And at the same time, the sessions are also focused on a small number of companies. So uh, we propose that one can use uh, this, uh, these facts or these uh, insights to build the recommendation systems in two stages. In that case, the first stage would be to predict uh, the company 
uh, of the next session or uh, companies of the next session and the company for the next filing. So this way uh, we reduce the problem of filing recommendation to the, to the first stage of like company recommendation, which will um, drastically uh, reduce the search space for from all filings to all findings of a specific company or companies. And then uh, the, in the second stage, uh, one, we need to rank these filings of these predicted companies for, 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 uh, for making the recommendations. Um, to conclude uh, this uh, talk, uh, what we did here in this uh, paper is analyzing this uh, lar public large data set called Edgar Lock file data set. And but we identified uh, different properties of uh, usage on the day uh, on, that are observable in the data set. We find out that like different user uh, will benefit from different type of recommendation in, uh, on this data set. And uh, we basically call for further research on this task of filing recommendation on Edgar. Um, thank you. This is it. So, uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, any questions? Uh, hi, I had a question. Am I audible? Yeah, please. Yeah, so I think it was established that each user explored a small set of companies. Were there any analysis done on top of it, as in like to identify what were these sort of companies? Were they in a particular domain, say certain tech specific, or were they having a certain market cap, like small cap companies or something like that? Um, thank you for the question. So uh, this, this is a very uh, important question. Uh, uh, of course, but uh, in this in this work, we didn't really look into like what uh, what type of companies are there. But as like one other like interesting follow up task, this could be interesting to see. For example, if there are like clusters of companies who are um, usually accessed together, or this like co occurrence of these companies in sessions, is, is there any pattern uh, or something like that? So this is uh, I would say an interesting follow up uh, question to answer. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, actually, uh, I I have a work related to uh, not not at not may, maybe related to the application scenario you propose, and uh, it's used for social media data. And uh, when we analyze the uh, data in on um, social media platform, I have the similar finding as you find that uh. People focus on uh, a few, only a few stocks instead of uh, uh, mention uh, like uh, e even even the stock in the Dow Jones Index. There are only uh, about thirty about thirty companies may may not be mentioned every day. Right. Some some company in Dow Jones. So uh, I think that uh, this question and some analysis to the. Uh, a kind of uh, company that uh, people uh, always focus on is uh, very uh, important. So, uh, yeah, and uh, additionally, uh, I think if, if you want to contract some uh, recommendation system, I think may maybe you can add the uh, stop movement, uh, stop history price to the recommendation system. That may also be helpful for uh, predict the uh, searching behavior of the uh, of like a crowd of professionals. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. makes sense. Yeah, let me share with that. And uh, any other questions? So uh, if, if not, I, I have uh, one more question about, uh, do you think uh, this kind of uh, like uh, seeking features uh, could be linked to the like market information of uh, other news articles. For example, uh, whether the uh, seeking time will increase when uh, like good news is released or like this kind of analysis, like cross document and cross behavior. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I think like all this uh, additional uh, information sources, like such as, as you previously mentioned, like social media and also news are important in, uh, in this uh, particular domain of financial uh, analysis. So, so any kind of pointer that you can get from this data could be uh, really useful in any kind of downstream task that you want to do. For example, in this case, recommendation, if you have additional information sources, yes, uh, I, I would assume that these are useful. Yeah, thank you. And uh, that, that, uh, the last comment is, uh, do, do you think that uh, like uh, it got systems searching behavior could okay. be considered as experts and like Google search, uh, analysis that Google search result can be considered as that crowds searching behavior and we can compare this kind of searching behavior? Yes, so that's actually very, a very interesting question. Yes, uh, I think in general, like most of this, uh, well, um, yeah, it's really, I don't really have a way to say like if most of these users are, uh, are financial experts or not, but in a sense, like compared to a general search engine such as uh, Google or Bing or something like that, I think like Edgar could be uh, considered as a, a more uh, domain specific and expert specific uh, search system. And there are also works on this uh, that kind of try to distinguish between even in the usage patterns of uh, Edgar itself, like if we can distinguish between more uh, more expert users or more uh, general uh, public who are just coming to the website. So there are works on this, and I do think that it's uh, it's possible to do that. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing. And uh, any other question? Okay. Thank you. Thank you for your sharing. And uh, you. let's. Going to the next presentation. Uh, hello, everyone. This is our paper, Tweet Post, which talks about the influence of social media features on the evaluation of NFTs. This is Mehul, and I'm with Dipan Mehta. And this is a project with Professor Manish, our collaborator, and Professor PK. And the other students with us on this project were Anand Kapoor and Rupanchu. And this was a joint effort of IIIT Hyderabad and IIIT Delhi students. So some introduction about uh, NFTs in general. So they use blockchain technology in the background, which uh, you know has transformed the financial ecosystem in the modern world. And NFTs themselves, which are like a non-fungible token, the type of cryptocurrencies and asset online like that people like to buy and sell have grown exponentially in the last year. They're reaching about 10, 10 million billion dollars in market cap. And some examples are like people selling their artworks or even people selling their tweets for like very high prices. And now because they're entirely digital, uh, people there's a lot of data available online. So we, we've used a platform called OpenSea, which is like an online marketplace for these things where people can buy and sell and can see all the data about an asset as in all the past transactions and all. And because we feel like NFT cup, NFT's prices are usually based on the perception of buyers, we think that Twitter would be a very good active social media platform to study the data related to NFTs. So the research questions that we explored in our paper, the first one is uh, to analyze the relationship between the user activity on Twitter and the price of the assets that they mentioned uh, on OpenSea. The second one is, uh, so this is a hypothesis that we try to test. Uh, the fact that signals from Twitter uh, contribute towards the valuation of the NFT as much as market features from OpenSea. And we do this by building models to predict the NFT value, as we will discuss later. Coming to the contributions, the first major contribution is the data set, which is public and adheres to the FAIR principles. So uh, we, in our knowledge, we create the first ever data set for NFTs linking OpenSea marketplace data and their corresponding tweets. We then go on to build an ordinal classification model to predict NFT asset value using signals from both OpenSea and Twitter. And finally, we test and show that our hypothesis holds true. That is Twitter features and OpenSea features contribute uh, almost similarly towards the pricing of the NFTs. Further, we see that the actual content of the NFTs, which is the images have very limited predictive power. 
so some some of the past work we saw that people usually don't uh, do uh, work on nfts in general or they do it mainly based on general cryptocurrencies or general coins that are out there and even if they do use social media features they mainly use it for let's say predicting prices in the stock market so but I, or if they want to use some nft valuation they mainly do it for predicting prices based on another other financial features which is basically forecasting based on past prices which is not what this paper does this paper uses social media features to you know predict that evaluation so a little bit about how we uh, evaluate nfts in our paper so nft prices are very they're not consistent and all they keep changing and the platform that we use OpenSea, we saw that the sales were very less like for since we do this at an asset level we saw that uh, a very small percentage 0.9 percent of total has had even more than five sales so uh, to account for all of this uh, we use something called an average selling price of an nft which is you know the selling price averaged over all its historic sales and uh, we group these prices into five logarithmic classes so one class is 10 to 100 dollars and 100 to 1000 dollars and so on Uh, and so uh, a basic primer about the open sea marketplace so every nft is listed as an asset and assets form a bigger group of similar so a group of similar assets is called a collection so each asset is uniquely identified by its address which is the address of the contract that deployed it and a token id the owners can list and auction NFTs, and the buyers can also participate in these listings and auctions, much like a very standard auction, uh, offline auction. And they can also make offers to the uh, owners. And most transactions are done on the Ethereum blockchain, which uh, is a digital ledger, and require a gas fee or a transaction fee. Uh, so coming to the data collection, uh, we have the pipeline divided into two. One is the Twitter part, where we collect a large number of tweets over three months in 2021, where the boom of NFTs happened. And each of these tweets contained the OpenSea.io asset link. And the data set contains a large number of unique users, assets belonging to unique collections. Coming to OpenSea, we use the publicly available API to collect asset and transaction level historical market data for each of the NFTs that are present in the Twitter data set. So now coming to some of the analysis that we did. So let's look at the, these graphs over here. First, we like try to look at the creation date of NFTs and the creation date of the accounts tweeting about the NFTs. So the graphs, uh, graph on the left shows over a period of the months that we collected the data, when the accounts uh, posting about NFTs were created and the NFTs themselves, they were created. And you can see from the correlation that people uh, tend to post soon about the uh, NFTs that they want to hype up so they, there was not much delay which is again properly shown by the graph on the right which is like a logarithmic plot of the delay in seconds between the posting of the tweet and the selling of the nft so you can see most of them are centered around 10 days to 5 or 10 days to 6 seconds which is about 1 to 10 days and then we tried to look at the popularity of the users themselves so the graph on the left divides the users into two parts one with the word nft in their usernames and one without the word nft in the usernames and as you can see, the one the users with the word NFT in the usernames shot up in the first three months of 2021, meaning that these accounts could be specifically created for the hype of NFTs. And then we try to look at the correlation between the popularity and the selling price of the NFTs. So the graph on the right shows a correlation plot between the follower count of the users and the selling price of the NFTs that they were tweeting about. And even though it's a weak positive correlation, we can still say that follower count does affect the prices positively. So we build models for the NFT valuation tasks that we've been discussing about. The first one is uh, we use a set of video feature, features which, which include features like number of likes, number of retweets, as well as number of followers of the users. We use OpenSea data on an asset level and a collection level. Uh, for the Twitter OpenSea uh, combinations as well as the individual models, we experiment with a range of classifiers such as logistic regression, uh, SVM, random forests, and XGBoost. XGBoost performs the best, as we will see later. For the image data, we build neural networks to capture image features and finally build predictive models. And we experiment with two architectures, ResNet and DenseNet. We uh, divide the data into different feature sets, and we also observe uh, the effect of combining them on the 
spread power. So uh, coming to the two types of models we built, first of all, uh, we have built binary models, which just predict if an asset sale is going to be profitable or not. And the second one is an ordinal model. So an ordinal model is essentially like a multi-class model, uh, just with, uh, with the order of classes preserved. The reason behind this is because our class one is uh, less significant, is less valuable than class two, class two less than class uh, three and so on. So we use an interval based approach to preserve the order of these classes. We train individual binary classifiers to predict if the asset class is greater than or less than a certain value. So the probability of an asset belonging to say a class two is the difference between the probability of the asset belonging to class one minus the probability of uh, the probability being greater than class one and the probability being greater than class two. And uh, as you can see, we use two metrics to validate our results. One is accuracy, and then we have uh, ordinal index. Accuracy is a very standard metric used for classification tasks. The ordinal index is a specifically designed uh, index that is used to measure the performance of ordinal classification. So uh, the coefficient actually conveys how far the outcome deviates from the ideal prediction and how inconsistent the classifier is with respect to the reductive order of the classes. So we see that the Twitter model performs uh, quite well. The OpenSea model, as expected, uh, does almost similar, but the best uh, metrics that we get is from the combination of Twitter and OpenSea. And we see an increase in accuracy by 6% over uh, the OpenSea features, uh, showing the importance that Twitter features also contribute significantly to the predictive task. Uh, and now showing the different types of accuracies and metrics across the models. So we used all these types of models, but the best performing one was XGBoost in terms of accuracy. And as you can see, in terms of ordinal index as well, lower the ordinal index, the better it is, as we already said. So XGBoost just performs the best. So we use that model itself to look at the feature importances also, which is on the right. So looking at feature importance, you can see as expected, the top ones are the financial features from OpenSea, which is like the offer entered or the bid on that asset. But the most important part is like significantly higher up above in the list are also Twitter features like listed count of that tweet or number of URLs or number of likes the tweet got, number of replies, which basically shows with our hypothesis is that Twitter features do come up high in the importance list when trying to predict the NFT prices. And now coming to the image features, we use CNNs for those and obtain accuracy is around 50% for all of them, even using DeathNet and ResNet, which shows that image features, which are the main content of NFTs, do not uh, uh, do not contribute much in the predicting power of the prices with low accuracy than OS1 scores. So in conclusion, uh, we track the growth of NFTs and we test our hypothesis that social media features actually, social media reach can impact the value of an NFT. And this is, uh, in our knowledge, one of the first works to characterize and value NFT assets using social media features. Further, we have built a working model that can actually guide sellers about the valuation of their assets so that they can test if their asset is uh, overpriced or underpriced and they're actually selling on open sale. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, any questions? Okay, let, let me ask the first question. Uh, because uh, I'm not familiar with NFT, so uh, I wonder uh, what's the main challenge issue for uh, NFT valuation? And uh, I also wonder the key difference from uh, like NFT to other ACES like stock or uh, foreign exchange, like uh, the traditional ACES that we know. Sure, so I'll just try to give a brief <laughs> overview of that. So essentially NFT is kind of, if you want to draw an equivalent, it would be saying that suppose you have a painting in the real world, you want that ownership of that painting is transformed into the digital world. So it's just, uh, it's essentially a block of code which assigns ownership to you. So it says that you essentially own that asset and that ownership can be verified by anyone because it's on the blockchain network. 
Now, where there are a lot of the two major challenges where it differs from say traditional assets like stocks would be one is the inherent valuation of it. So in stocks, we have these fundamental things which are like what's the earnings, what's the PE ratio, what's the market capitalization of the thing. So there is this fundamental sort of things to a stock market, which is very tangible in some senses. So you know that, say, a stock like Meta is going to be valued more than a very upcoming startup, which doesn't have any employees or which doesn't have any sort of user base or XYZ. So there's this tangibility aspect to it. Uh, second aspect is that stocks are very frequently traded. So for every millisecond or every second, there are thousands of stocks being traded, like millions of trades happening. So we know the exact value at each point of time. So if I'm trying to model it as a time series forecasting thing, I can take the previous values and just model the next value and kind of say that it's because I have the sort of number of data points that I have are going to be a lot because I can take it at every five minute interval, 10 minute interval and so on. The challenge with NFT here is first, it's very intangible. Like if you sell a particular painting versus I sell a particular painting, if you draw equivalent with the marketplace, the reason why one sells more for the other, it's hard to assign a tangibility to it. It's probably the popularity aspect of it or what the reputation you have gained on it. And because NFT entirely originated on the so online digital world. So there are not these well-established painters of 16th century, say, who we know are very good. So it's it's entirely conceptualized or based on, say, in some senses, your popularity or how much traction you are able to gain or assign to your essentially asset. That is why, say, prediction entirely using social media is something that you will go for instead of using it very sort of traditional features. And the second aspect that I told was just the frequency of sales because you will have very... Uh, you will have like just five sales over a period of three to four months. So posing it as just a next price prediction problem becomes challenging because the data points are very limited and they vary a lot. So you could have one asset being sold for say hundred dollars today and then that rising up to a factor of hundred X the next time it gets sold and then falling down. So that's why to assign a value to an NFT became becomes like, because it's a very niche and developing sort of field. So this is, our, at least our work was just an effort to kind of create a data set, have people explore about it. That was one of the contribution. And then we worked on some models to see how exactly were we able to kind of capture this value aspect using these features. Uh, it was a, probably a very long answer, but I hope I was able to answer uh, your uh, question. Yeah, thank, thank, thank you for your uh, answering and uh, answering detail. Thank you. I think, I think, uh, um, maybe okay so it, it's interesting because uh i think this is it, it's very early working that uh nft valuation so i uh, thank you and uh any other questions so uh if not, but maybe you already have answered some of my second question, but uh, I still want to uh, check that uh, because there are many uh, like uh, stock valuation or stock movement prediction methods. So from methods aspect, uh, I think maybe some methods in uh, like stock movement prediction or stock valuation can be used to NFT valuation. And uh, do you have any like suggestions or do you think that it will also work or uh, why we cannot use the same uh, methods? Uh, as you say, the data, data uh, period is shorter than the start, uh, but uh, are there other limitation or uh, some suggestions? Yeah, I think so. it's, it's probably that just the volatility is very high. So it's like saying that you're probably not going to get any sort of predictive value because a lot is determined by external factors, how NFTs are perceived externally as well. But yeah, I think so if you like, we have been exploring related works in literature as well, trying to link up with existing sort of well-established literature and stock prediction and whether we can use something of those models in this. But yeah, I think so just the, just the nature of the data is probably a bit too different. So that's why if you want to do something like stock prediction in say crypto coins, 
that's very doable because Bitcoin again is traded very frequently and all that stuff. The analogy that you want to draw from say, from the traditional world would be like the traditional art marketplace. So what you would look to is like say a painting is sold and it's sold multiple times. How exactly would that work out? So that's probably just the distinction, the parallel that we want to draw. So that's the literature that we're looking more at. I, I see. Thank you. Thank you for your answer. And uh, any other questions? Okay. So uh, if uh, there are no other questions, uh, it's the uh, break time. And uh, please come back after uh, 15 minutes and we'll start to the uh, show paper and poster sessions. So uh, welcome back and uh, let's start the next session, show paper and poster. And uh, I'll play the first video. Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, I'll be talking about my work, a generative approach for financial causality extraction. Uh, this is a joint work by, the, by me, Soma Sarma, Yas Butala, Pustav Das Gupta, Professor Pawan Goel, and Professor Nilayangul. This is a joint collaboration between IIT Kharagpur, India, and Goldman Sachs, India. So what is the task? So we are, the task is extracting financial causality uh, from the financial text. So causality is basically a cause and effect event pair. So, so as many as financial causalities we want, we want to extract from the uh, given text. So uh, one example is given here. So at the left hand side, you can see the financial text and the right hand side, you can see two cause and effect pair. One is C1E1, that is a cause, cause span and effect span for causality one and C2E2 for the, for the second one. So these cause and effect spans are continuous text in the uh, in the given uh, given text and uh, and C1 and C2 even or E1 and E2 they may be overlapping. So what are the challenges in this task? So this is a passage level extraction task, not sentence level, and cause effect spans in financial domain can be quite longer, and uh, there can be multiple cause and effects uh, pairs in the text. And there is another challenge overlapping causality. So cause and effect span uh, may be shared across multiple causality. So basically one cause span participating in two causalities or one effect span is part of two causalities. So our goal is to extract all the causalities, including the overlapping. So also we need to remember during the inference time, we should not know how many causalities are there in the text. So related work previously, mainly sequence leveling approaches are proposed to this task. Uh, so they basically use BIO tags for cause and effects, and uh, then they use a bitter V decoding algorithm to identify the longer, uh, longer cause and effect span. And they pair up the cause and effect span based on their location. So two nearby cause and effect spans will be paired off with each other. So this problem, this approach has some, some, some definite problem. One of problem is the overlapping causalities. So if one cause span or one effect span is shared across multiple causalities, this kind of approach won't work. Also in case of multiple causalities, uh, the pairing up the cause and effect span based on their you know, nearby location is, may not be the optimal, optimal uh, solution. And also these works assume the how many causalities will be there before beforehand. So three or four, but in a practical scenario, practical settings, we would not know how many causalities are there. That number will be unknown. So what is our approach? So we we identify the cause and effect spans using the start and end index in the text. You can see in the same example, we 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 use this positional sequence. In the positional sequence, the first first number is a index of the start uh, tokens in the in the text for the cause span and 47 is the end index of the cause span is it is the start index of the effect span and 30 is the start index of the effect end index of the effect span so the four numbers so as many as uh, cause and effect pairs will be there there will be such, uh, such quadruples will be there and then we will use an end of sequence marker to uh, and the generative sequence analysis. 
So we use input or decoder framework to extract as many as causalities. So at every step of the decoding process, we extract the cause and effect span of a causality. And since the decoder frameworks actually can uh, can decode as many as causalities, so there we don't need to know the number of causalities beforehand. We use the end of sequence uh, marker to stop the decode, so decoding process. And since at every time step we generate you know, generate a causality, that means cause and effect pair together. So the overlap is causality problem will be solved automatically because um, the shared cause span or effect span will be treated differently for different um, uh, causalities. So our approach does not need to know the number of causalities beforehand, and end of sequence marker is used to stop the ex extraction process. So this is our um, basically overview of our network. So we have a text encoder. So here text encoder we can use LSTM or BART based encoder. And there is a decoder, decoding part. In decoding, we have a sequence generator LSTM. These LSTM actually generate the how many generate basically a sequence of uh, sequence of causalities, and then the encoder representation is passed to this LSTM using an attention layer. Now to identify this cause and effect span, we use two pointer network. Each pointer network has a bio LSTM and two feed forward layer with their softmax. So these bio LSTMs output the hidden vectors. Uh, will be converted into a scalar score in this fit for our network. And then we apply the softmax across this fit for across the scalar score to identify what is the start span. Similarly, another fit for our layer with softmax is used, used to identify the end index of the span. And now this uh, these spans are interchangeable, like we can extract the cause span first, then extract the effect span, or we can do the vice versa. So there is not much of significant difference. So you, for, for our final experiment, we use BART and we use a special unused token at the beginning of the text to mark the end sequence generation. So basically, 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 since this token will be at the beginning of it, so the end of sequence marker, uh, the start index for the cause span or effect span or uh, will be zero. So using that, we stop the decoding process. So for experiment, we use the fin puzzle 2020 and fin puzzle 2020 data sets. Their blind test data is not available. So we use five fold cross validation on the training data and report the average numbers. So these are the statistics of the data sets. And you can see uh, the average length, uh, average length of the text is quite long, like 40 tokens. Then cause and effect span average is 18 tokens, 17 tokens. And they have inter-sentence causalities and cross-sentence causalities. So basically it's causalities may uh, maybe part of two different sentences. Now we compare with uh, multiple state of the art baselines. Most of these baselines are sequence leveling approach. Now we can see the CF model, which is cause first, and, and the EF is extraction first. And we, have, we can see that the CF and EF performs almost equally. And BART large model actually performs a little better than the uh, BART base model. So in conclusion, we propose a point and network based and product approach for this causality extraction and our model actually solve all the real world challenges that is that are present in this task. And we 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 release our code and data for further uh, research. Thanks. I, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Sharma. Uh, any questions? Okay, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I'm sorry that it seems like you cannot run my team's code. So, uh, but I think the code is supposed to work be uh, uh, because, uh, so, so uh, let me know uh, the detail after the workshop because uh, I'm one of the author of the, uh, NTU MLPL nothing, and uh, you mentioned that uh, you cannot run our code in your paper. So uh, please let me know the detail. And uh, I I have a question is that uh, have you tried to use a uh, FinBird as an encoder in your model? Because uh, I guess uh, the performance could include increase a bit. I think like uh like this FinBird.
Hi, uh, I will be answering uh, myself, Tapos. I am the first author, so I will be answering. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, the, so the FinBird, yeah, we know about the FinBird model. I think we did some experiments also, but could not see much of difference. Uh, oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because uh, in many paper I review and uh, in the experiment in my team, uh, it seems like it, yeah, FinBird is work in some uh, financial news data. So, uh, so in your experiment, uh, the result is similar yeah, to uh, we, just use similar, yeah. yeah. Right. I see. Yeah. I see. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, any other questions? No. Uh, great. Thank you for your presentation and answering. And uh, let's yeah, go to next presentation. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Hello everyone, I am Shohom and I am here to demonstrate our tool FinCAT, Financial Numeral Claim Analysis Tool. Dr. Noskar and I contributed towards development of this tool. We are affiliated to Jalapur University and Fidelity Investments. Overview, investors tend to make data-driven decisions by consuming financial contents available online. Numerals present in these contents may be simply claims by executives and not facts. Our motivation is to help investors to identify out-of-claim numerals so that they don't get allured by the in-claim numerals. We present the tool FinCAT for the same. Just an example, uh, you see at the bottom of the slide, in the year 2021, the markets were bullish. We expect to boost ourselves by 80% this quarter. In these two sentences, the first sentence, 2021, is an out of claim numeral, whereas 80%, the numeral 80% present in the second sentence, is an in claim numeral. Data set. We used FinNum3, Investors and Managers Fine Grained Claim Detection Dataset, which is in English. This dataset was released as a part of NTCIR16 Shared Task. The training dataset contained 8,337 records, out of which 1,039 were in claims. The validation set contained 1,191 instances out of which 114 were in claims. Each labeled record consists of the following. A financial text, a numeral present within the text, starting position of the numeral, ending position of the numeral, category of the numeral, label that is whether the particular numeral is in claim or out of claim. We have shown the word clouds of the training and validation set separately for the in-claim and out-of-claim instances in the right-hand side of the slide. Methodology. The tool looks for words in the input text which contains at least one digit. For such numeral, we extract six words preceding and succeeding it. We refer to this as a context window. Given this context window, we calculate the average of the bird embeddings of the constituent tokens present in the target numeral. This means that the context window, I mean the context, uh, contextual embeddings of the target numeral having 768 dimensions, we pass uh, this uh, embedding to a logistic regression model and the prediction is whether the particular uh, numer target numeral is in claim or out of the claim. In the example which you see over here, 80% uh, this gets uh, tokenized into 89% separately. We extract the embeddings of these two tokens. We take a mean of that uh, logistic regression layer on the top and that's how we get the prediction. 
Next, uh, we move on to the results and discussions. We tried several classification algorithms like logistic regression, random forest, gradient boosting machine, light GPM, XG boost, and so on. Uh, we tried various embeddings as well, like BERT, Robo Robota, and so on. A logistic regression model trained over BERT embeddings gave the best performance on the validation set. Here are the results. Let's have a look at the live demo of this tool. You can use it directly from Hugging Face Spaces. Link has been shared. So uh, here you can write any text. Uh, for the sake of time, I have uh, taken this text. You, you can just hit clear to clear this tool if you want to start from the beginning. You can select any text or you can write it from here. I will just use this text as it is. Click on submit. And on the right hand side, you get the in claim and out of claim uh, numerals marked. You also get a table where the numerals, their predictions and their probability has been mentioned. Moving on, uh, the conclusion and the future works. Conclusion, to conclude, we have uh, developed and open source and also deployed a FinCat which can be used to detect in claim numerals in financial text. In future, we shall work on improving uh, the performance of the model further and uh, take numerals uh, to, which are to be evaluated as an input from the user. For, if we do this, then we don't have to do the computation for all the numerals that will save some computing time and resources as well. Another interesting direction for future research can be towards creating a browser-based extension which will be able to detect numerals from financial web pages in real time. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, thank thank you for using Binance Re data set and join join us in uh, NTCR. And uh, for those who do not know uh, NTCR, let me share the link with you. And uh, this in NTCR uh, there are many interesting uh share tags uh, every year. So uh, if you are interested to the result related to like the uh, Binance Re resource used in uh, this paper, uh, you can join us. I think this year is free, so uh, you can just register and uh, join us uh, in June. Okay, and uh, so uh, I, I, I have a question is, uh, do, do you have any idea how to use the proposed system in real world application? Because, uh, yeah, because uh, I'm, I'm not sure how to use this system. Yeah, so uh, we have uh, deployed it in Hugging Face, so you can use it directly from Hugging Face. That is number one. Number two, we have uh, shared our Colab link. So you can just uh, upload the data, data in Colab and you can uh, get the uh, corresponding output. And number three is we have open source three uh, code in GitHub, so you can just fork it and you can use it. So all three methods are available. Yeah, I see. I see, but uh, I think most specifically is, uh, do you have any plan to use the like detecting resource for other texts like uh, stock movement prediction or uh, some financial related text? So oh, what we have uh, in uh, our mind is like using it in uh, creating some kind of browser based extensions and uh, within the browser that extension will reside. So whenever the investors are reading some text online, it will just highlight that this is a uh, in claim numeral please be aware while making some kind of investment decisions so that is something which uh, we have in mind other than that uh, we haven't uh, thought of using it i mean we have some uh, key use cases in mind for using it in some downstream task but uh, that we are yet to materialize now it's uh, still in the planning phase i see i see so uh, it's a kind of assistant systems for uh, exactly. provide like yeah 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 as as uh readers to pay attention to some inclined numeral like that right right, right. right. okay 
Okay, I see. Thank, thank you for your sharing. And thank you for and, sharing uh, the data set. Yeah, sure. No problem. And uh, any other questions? Okay, so uh, let's go into the next pre presentation. And thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I would just like to uh, present our work on ready portfolios and matrix decomposition. This is work by Francois in collaboration with myself and Zan. Um, I would like to mention that any views expressed in here are our own and our own only. Um, as we all know, in the 1960s, uh, portfolio management took a big leap forward with Markowitz, the efficient frontier. There have been additions since the Black Letterman framework, arbitrage pricing theory, multi period uh, approaches. Now, within that whole world of portfolio management, there are some, uh, some very important KPIs. So, key performance indicators such as uh, the Sharpe ratio, the information ratio, minimum concentration, maximum diversification, things like that. Now, our aim here is to take all those KPIs and put them in a generic framework. Now we'll re recast the old convex optimization approaches and we'll recast them as traditional machine learning. Um, and we'll show some nice algorithms that, and efficient algorithms that will um, provide solutions for all those KPIs. Now, looking back at those, uh, the previous slides, when we look at sharp ratio information ratio, you're looking to maximize uh, excess return or return over the portfolio standard deviation. Now, in the expression on the left, uh, the W um, stands for a vector with the allocation in your investment universe. Um, U stands for the expected return, R is the risk-free rates, and sigma is the covariance matrix of all the individual assets in your universe. Now, the same will hold uh, for um, the expressions for maximum diversification and minimum concentration. Now, the latter two are basically ratios of standard deviations with different assumptions on um, each portfolio. The, uh, the difference being the portfolio in the numerator and the denominator. Now, for maximum diversification, it's a ratio of a portfolio with a correlation one and a portfolio where you have actually uh, estimated or are given the individual correlations. Now, the minimum concentration uh, portfolio is a bit simpler uh, in that it shows um, the ratio of standard deviation between a, a portfolio with zero correlation and with correlation of one. Now, all these expressions on the left can be rewritten as the expression on the right. Now you'll notice that these expressions look very similar. Um, now we'll take those expressions and we'll recast them and actually make them more flexible in the next slide. So you can rewrite the numerator with a parameter delta, uh, where a delta is between zero and one. Now you could assign a delta to be zero, one and get back to the old KPIs from the previous slide. Um, but you could also um, do cross-validation, for instance, and kind of come up with an optimal delta. Or you could um, assign a subject delta as a subjective measure between uh, how much uh, a portfolio manager might care between return and the risk they're running. Um, the same for the numerator, where we use gamma as a parameter. And you could see it as a, a balance between the concentration risk and the trust in the estimation of the covariance matrix. Now, the generic formula that we show for all these KPIs is in the third line where we take that expression and we re rewrite it as, these, as this ratio. Now, we can define we define that ratio as a Rayleigh ratio, um, inspired by the Rayleigh quotient uh, because it is extremely similar. Um, now, in this expression, B is a positive definite matrix and A is a positive semi-definite. Um, now, taking the fact that B is positive semi-definite, we can actually do some nice and uh, fancy algebra, but simple. 
uh, to get to rewrite our Rayleigh ratio uh, with a different A and B. And in this setting, B becomes the unitary matrix. Now that means that we've recast the problem as a PCA problem. Um, so now, now the solution will, of the expression will be uh, the maximum eigenvalue of this uh, rewritten A, well, A matrix. Note that in a Rayleigh ratio, the solutions are symmetric. So W and minus W will give exactly the same uh, maximum value. Now, that it's important to choose between the two, especially if you're looking at returns. Uh, so we use a reference vector, for instance, which could be the mean returns uh, that allows us to choose uh, between the two. Could also be the standard deviations, depending on the KPI. Now, every portfolio manager um, will have uh, some type of constraints. Uh, so these could be constraints in terms of um, number of individual assets that they can hold or assets within a certain sector or um, like given the number of transaction costs, they don't want to hold too many assets, but they still want to um, make the best return, of course, and the minimum uh, risk. Now, apart from all those constraints, there is also the fact that uh, portfolio managers want to have robust results, robust KPIs. Um, now, in order to do that, there's plenty, the standard way of doing that in, in statistical learning is to use sparsity. Right? So we can use sparsity right here. Uh, so that would mean that we could use a budget constraints to allocate um, within our within our portfolio vector, basically. So we would interpolate between a full diversification and individual stock picking in this setting. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we show that the Rayleigh ratio can be rewritten as a biconvex problem. So that means uh, when you're looking to minimize the expression on the right, um, given WV, which are two vectors, uh, the expression will be a convex problem uh, in W if V is constant, and it will be a convex problem in V if W is constant. Now that gives, that opens us up to um, a series of standard algorithms to solve these problems. Uh, even when we add uh, sparsity in the mix uh, to W, where W is the, again, the asset allocation, um, we get the same uh, biconvexity uh, property. Now we use a, an algorithm, a modified algorithm from Daniela Witten on the penalized matrix decomposition, uh, where uh, we add in a matrix multiplication in, in her steps and we also use um, our, our reference vector in order to solve our symmetry problem. Um, now, of course, you require a given uh, matrix A and a given matrix B. There's a sparsity parameter, which is now uh, an input from the portfolio manager and the goal, the goal vector M, which will be determined by the KPI. And then you uh, go through the algorithm and it converges. Now, uh, how do we actually apply this? So we showed uh, we took uh, three uh, stock indices, the DAX, the CAC, and the FTSE. This is the German stock index, the French, and the UK stock index. There's 30 names, 40 names, and 100 names in each. We took 12 years of that in daily data. Um, we took a KPI, in this case, minimum concentration. We took the in-sample data we computed minimum concentration using our methods. Then we took the weights from that in-sample data and we applied the same weights to the entire out-of-sample um, period, which we held constant throughout the out-of-sample period. Now these graphs, they plot the out-of-sample uh, on KPI on the y-axis and the in-sample KPI on the x-axis. So you see quite an amazing stability in minimum concentration. And that stability is higher um, the more names are in, in the index, which is not surprising because you 
have less idiosyncratic risk in, 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 um, in that case. Um, now, taking the same uh, issue, the same setting, but now applying it to maximum diversification, um, it becomes less stable. Um, now, it still works in CAC and FTSE, but not so much in DAX. Now, DAX has less names, so you are more sensitive to idiosyncratic risk, but also maximum diversification, uh, if you recall, takes into account correlation of individual um, assets, pairwise individual assets, whereas minimum concentration just assumes correlation um, of zero and correlation of one. Now, by looking at maximum diversification, you're assuming a kind of stationarity of those correlations across the ensemble and out of sample, which is unlikely to be the case. Yeah, um, we hope that we've convinced you of um, this Rayleigh ratio approach. And do let us know if uh, you have any questions. We'll be more than happy to answer them. Thank you. So uh, thank you for the presentation. And uh, I wonder whether the authors are here, here because uh, it seems that like I cannot find your name in the uh, participants list. So I think the author is not here. Now, uh, if you have any questions, please uh, send an email to them for asking questions. And uh, so uh, let's go into the next presentation. Good morning, everyone. I'm excited to present our work on SEBI regulation biography. Securities and Exchange Board of India, commonly referred to as SEBI, is the regulatory body for securities and commodity market in India. And Indian companies are obligated to adhere to the regulations drafted by SEBI. And these regulations need to be interpreted by finance department and information technology departments to be diligently followed. On the right, you can see the kind of documents that are released by SEBI, such as regulations, annual reports, news, uh, press briefings, etc. Manual analysis of these documents is tedious owing to document size and suffer from inability to discover interlinked information. An AI system can aid and improve its interpretations and distractions by automatically processing and deriving insights from SEBI regulations, associated documents, and other uh, case files. On the right, you can see an example of SEBI regulatory document, namely Prohibition of Insider Trading Regulations 2015. So PIT regulations were amended in 2015 and this, this amended version of the regulations is being shown here. Um, each regulatory document also has uh, chapters where uh, relevant regulations are grouped together and each regulation could have other sub-regulations. So uh, regulatory document is quite structured. We built four modules as part of uh, our work and these uh, together offer a better understanding of regulatory document, its regulations and its metamorphosis over time as amendments. The first module is semantic extraction of regulation where we built an NER model to detect SEBI relevant entities present in regulations. We consulted domain legal experts and we selected these 10 entities relevant to SEBI. For example, subject individual is subject or class of individuals who engage in securities market and upon whom the regulations might apply. Named entity recognition in, in SEBI regulations is uh, a challenging task because there is a presence of overlapping entities in SEBI regulations. Uh, for example, here where shall be disclosed in the offer document is an objective, but the offer document itself is a legal term. Detecting these kind of overlapping entities is quite important and we built a spacey NER pipeline uh, where we experimented with training one NER model for each entity with the aim to check if individual models could produce overlapping entities through a combination of their independent predictions. We used two evaluation schema, strict and exact and both of them gave an F1 score of around 0.74 with a precision of 0.87 and recall of around 0.65. 
the regulation timeline module gives an overview of how each regulation is amended over time and makes it easier to understand the changes that are done as part of each amendment. Each regulation can be represented as a chain of blue nodes. For example, alternate investment funds are being shown from 2012 to 2021. And this timeline offers various aspects of regulations. Example, the content of the regulation, the changes that are happening between success regulations and related SEBI documents. On clicking on a blue node, you can see the tabularized list of uh, these regulations and also any entities that are being detected by our semantic extraction module are uh, highlighted. The regulations comparison module compares the regulations that are present in two successive uh, amendments of the regulatory document and tries to map out what kind of changes have happened per each regulation. For example, here, uh, the third point uh, in 19F regulations of 2013 and 2021 has a slight change uh, where the lock-in period of an angel fund has been moved from three years to one year. So these kind of changes have to be captured because they play a vital role in how a company makes its financial decisions. We are also providing these, these tags which uh, have been built uh, by using a rule-based tagging system and uh, we, uh, we uh, took the help of domain legal experts and this rule based tagging helps you give helps you take in a quick look at the regulation comparison and see what kind of changes have been happening next comes amendment rationale where we match regulations with the reason for amendment from documents like annual reports for example a snippet about Corrective Investment Scheme Regulations from Annual Reports 2013-14 has been mapped with this particular regulation which talks about how Corrective Investment Management companies have to behave in, in relation to Corrective Investment Schemes. So matching this rationale is very important to understand why a regulation has been amended or introduced in the first place. On clicking on a red node, you can also see the related documents that are uh, pertinent to the regulation in question. Uh, such as consultative papers, guidelines, press releases that are being put out by SEBI. The regulation template creation module helps in molding a regulation into a pseudocode like format for better understanding of the regulatory documents. Structure of SEBI regulations is very well defined and uh, it has entities conditioned actions where entities are the subject of regulation and upon whom certain actions are uh, to take place with uh, upon fulfillment of uh, or not fulfillment of a particular condition. For example, compliance officer is the entity upon approval of the trading plan as an action and shall notify the plan to stock exchanges is the action. Uh, finally, we take these regulations and put it into this template format where uh, this if else template format where regulations corresponding to a single single entity can be grouped together. We are also providing any um, context that is needed such as other sub regulations for better understanding of the regulation. Next coming to the knowledge graph module where we combine all the three previous modules and we built a knowledge graph that connects regulatory documents with news articles and case files also. And these news articles and case files have been collected from sources like SEBI and Indian Canon which is the repository of legal cases and other online news sources. Our knowledge graph model can be pictorially represented in this format where our regulation timeline has been discussed already. Let me explain to you about our news articles and adjudication order view where we extract references of regulations from news articles and adjudication orders and provide them with the relevant regulation pages to mine these to mine these relationships, we use Flair Ontonote's NER tagger and perform weighted scoring for these entities. Here is a view of our knowledge graph where case files and news articles that are relevant to the regulation question here, prohibition of inside trading, are being attached to the regulation so that uh, a person can see all the relevant case files and news articles. In conclusion, we present a tool for comprehensive understanding of SEBI regulation 
and uh, our data set code train models and demo have been made available for public use we would like to thank jp morgan ai faculty research award for funding this work thank you Uh, thank you for your sharing. And uh, any questions? Uh, okay, I I just want to share an idea and uh also ask your suggestion. Uh, do you think that we can train a like pre-trained language model for like linking the regulation document and the related articles? Like it, it, it seems like the knowledge graph or some document linking that like you mentioned in this work. Be, be, because uh, in this year ACL, uh, there uh, is a new pre-trained language model called Linkbird. Uh, it, it seems like this kind of chain can capture uh, like uh, multi-hub knowledge. So uh, I wonder how to think about that. Uh, I think the, this one was you. Okay, so uh, let me. Uh, hi, sorry, I was on mute. Uh, uh, hi. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, we haven't really thought about that, but we'll definitely give it a look. Thank you for your suggestions. But yeah, sorry. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for yeah, thank you. answering. Yeah, thank you. And uh, any other questions? Okay, let's go to the next presentation. Hi, my name is Ajwal, and I'm from the International Institute of Information Technology, Hyderabad. Today, I'll be presenting our work on the regulation violation detection for an Indian regulatory body. The regulatory body that we are interested in is the Securities and Exchange Board of India. It is the regulatory body for the securities and commodities market and not just makes the rules but also enforces that the rules and regulations are followed and non-compliance is punished. We notice that violations of the same regulations typically have similar circumstances, events and actions. These circums events and actions are what we call as the facts of the case. We also notice that most of the violations occur from a very small subset of regulations. So we hypothesize, can we detect these automatically by leveraging publicly available case files? So how do we go about doing this? Well, as in any supervised machine learning task, first we'll need a data set. So we first focus on creating a data set that we can then train a model with. For creating a data set, we have two main factors. We need the data and the labels. For the labels, we need to identify which regulations are violated. And for the data, we need to identify from the case file what are the facts of the case. Given this data set, we now pose this as a multi-label classification problem. So given the facts of the case and our different regulations, we predict a one hot vector of dimension R, where if the R dimension is flipped or is true, then we know that the R regulation is violated. For a data, we have two major sources. We have the SEBI regulations and we have the SEBI case files. So SEBI regulations is the actual list of rules and regulations that all companies abide by and is periodically published and updated by SEBI. SEBI case files are the case files where if a company disagrees with SEBI's judgment, they can file an appeal against the SEBI order, which are handled by the Securities Appellate Tribunal or the SAT. And these are the data case files that we'll be working with. As talked about earlier, not all regulations are important. We notice that out of the approximately 750 different regulations, only 49 of these have more than 50 reported violations. Thus, we consider these 49 regulations and group the remaining 700 odd regulations as a single rest of the other class ending up with 50 labels or 50 regulations that we're trying to predict for. Now that we know what regulations we're interested in, how do we know if these regulations are violated? We'll leverage English spacey off-the-shelf models to perform NER, 
that is named entity detection to detect if a particular regulation has been mentioned. If a particular regulation has been mentioned, it's usually annotated with the lot tag. But however, we observe that the English of the shelf models do not recognize many of the regulation mentions. Therefore, we annotate 15 more case files and retain spacey to identify these regulation mentions. Now that we know if a particular regulation has been mentioned, how do we know if it has been violated? We therefore create a set of patterns and rules based on keywords to detect if a regulation has been violated. Thus, a regulation is said to be violated if we identify the regulation citation in the case file and if the citation matches one of our predefined set of patterns and rules. Now that we know how to detect regulations, how do we identify the facts of the case? With the help of our legal experts, we have created 10 sentence level labels. Out of these 10 labels, 4 of these deal with facts and therefore we are only interested in these 4. We built a context aware classification engine using not just the sentence but the sentence on the left and the right, therefore the surrounding sentences as well. We annotate 25 more case files for these sentence labels and we train with an 80-20 split to get an F1 score of 0.75. As mentioned earlier, we are interested in four major facts. These facts are the statutory facts, procedural facts, material facts, and related facts. And we shall discuss more of these facts in the coming slides. Statutory facts are facts and statements that are made that invoke rules, regulations, and acts by survive, either by using their representative names or by quoting them in totality. So for example, we have Regulation 4, Section 1 of PFUTP regulations prohibits persons from indulging in a fraudulent or an unfair trade practice in securities. Such a sentence would be classified as a statutory fact. Statements that contain generic information on the procedure duly followed by the authorities to set this process of adjudication in motion is termed as procedural facts. So the following statements. SEBI conducted an investigation in respect of buying, selling, and kneeling in the shares of GCL during the following time period would therefore be classified as a procedural fact. Statements that contain information about the case that is relevant and important in deciding the outcome as well as the penalty, if there is a penalty to be given, is called as material facts. So for example, the price reached the period low of rupees 1.16 and finally closed at rupees 1.53, a number fifth. This statement gives an indication to the monetary gain made by violating the regulations and therefore can be classified as a material fact. Statements made in a general sense, including truisms, re-emphasis of facts, which do not constitute the facts of this case, but are material in deciding its outcome, are called as related facts. One common example of related facts in legal case files are quoting precedents from previous case files, as shown in the example here. To give a brief summary of the pipeline that we've described so far, we have two major data sources, SEBI case files and SEBI regulations. From SEBI regulations through SPACI, NAR and patterns, we identify which regulation has been violated. And through our case file segmentation model, we identify what which other or what other facts are the case. Pulling this together, we now have labels and data, and we train and validate with the supervised machine learning model. In the following sections, we'll discuss our approaches to the model and the results that follow. For our baseline, we choose a combination of features and traditional ML approaches, such as random forests, support vector machines, and MLPs. For features, we used combinations of character engrams, word engrams, and averaged glove embeddings. We also experiment with neural approaches, such as LSTMs, hierarchical LSTMs, and BERT-based architectures. For evaluation, we use the common practices with multi-label classifications such as Hamming loss and F1 scores. We know from literature in the science and the medical domain that BERT typically does not do well on very specific domain related tasks. This is typically due to stylistic lexical differences and the introduction of jargon. Therefore, we fine tune BERT on all the regulations and case file data that we have. In addition to this, we also augment this data with a set of financial news articles that we scraped from the web which are related to SEBI. This way, by fine-tuning BERT, we create SEBI BERT. As we hear in the results, most of the models in the traditional ML setup perform quite poorly with the linear SVM performing the best with the highest F1 score. But 
does not have that great of an humming loss curve. However, we have the MLP with the word engrams having the lowest humming loss curve and therefore performing the best, even though it does not perform as well as the linear SVM when comparing with the F1 scores. In the neural setup, we see, as expected, Sabai Bert outperforms the other models by a significant margin, having both the highest F1 as well as the lowest Hamming loss score. We also see that other than Sabai Bert, Bert performs well, but because of Sabai Bert's domain related knowledge, it outperforms Bert. Hierarchical LSTM also performs better than vanilla LSTMs, primarily due to its ability to capture long term dependencies much better than when in LSTMs. Predicting regulation violation is a challenging task and we summarize our key takeaways here. To predict whether regulation has been violated or not, we must first understand all the facts of the case. Violations are often the results of multiple facts and these facts must be analyzed together, which becomes harder as the number of facts increases. Approaches such as sliding windows or hierarchical methods can alleviate this problem to some extent but they also suffer from long range attention. Facts of the case can also span from a few sentences to hundreds of sentences, depending on how complex the case or the situation is. We also deal with a lot of avalanche effect. Avalanche effect is a property where a small change in the input results in a massive change in the output. Two case files can have a large overlap between the facts of the case, but a single difference can result in one case file violating and the other not violating a particular regulation. We also deal with a lot of domain specificity here. Due to the domain, there exists a large amount of specific terminology and jargon. In the legal domain especially, there exists strict constraints on the meaning as well, and a small misunderstanding can have enormous consequences. Moreover, standard MLP tools that are typically applicable in the general domain do not transfer as well, and thus domain specific tools have to be built for tasks such as entity recognition. We also deal with specific entities that are only found in uh, the legal domain, such as, or in the Indian context, such as the Badliwalas, that are financiers who lend money to both buyers and sellers, which are not found elsewhere. And therefore, it solutions have to be custom built for this particular domain. This work has been supported by JP Morgan AI Faculty Research Award, and any opinions, findings, and conclusions in this paper are those of the authors only and do not necessarily reflect the views of the sponsors. Thank you. If you have any questions, please reach out to me at the following email address. Hi, my name is Ajwal and I'm from Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. I think we, we still can have some uh, quick questions. Any questions from participants? Okay, now let me ask one. Uh, I, I think reg regulation technology is one of the interesting topic in uh, fintech duration. But uh, I wonder, uh, have you surveyed the current models? Like, uh, because language may not be an issue uh, in like, like bird, multilingual bird. We have many kinds of bird. So uh, I think this kind of test also is pro in some uh, regulation uh, issues in other countries, in other language. So have you uh, surveyed that and uh, which is the state of the art methods that use in the current, like, like this text? Uh, yeah, so people have done this, <coughs> excuse me. People have done this for other contexts, like in the general domain, not in the financial domain, like with uh, human rights violations in the EU and things like that. And from what we've seen so far, most of them also opt for a similar approach to this, where we typically have a large language model and then classification or some other architecture, like maybe a GCN on top. Uh, we, I think you also asked about QA question answering systems earlier. So with that experiment with Q&A systems as well, and maybe opposing this, formulating this instead of a classification task as a Q&A task, and the results weren't that great. So we decided that classification like multi-label classifications seem to be the way to go for this. I see. I see. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for answering. Thank you. And any other questions? Okay. Uh, thank you. And let's go to the next presentation. Mr. Chairman, honorable guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am 
honored and proud to have the opportunity to present at this meeting. Today, I would like to present my paper, Numerators Detection in Chinese Financial News. My presentation will include five parts, introduction about this research, information about this site construction, our models and uh, experiments, and finally, I will make a conclusion. Numer has played a very important role in text semantics, especially in some specific fields, such as the financial field. A study has pointed out that the lowest probability of Numer is in earning calls, reaching 50 5.3%, and the highest probability of numer is in financial news, up to 99.8%. The importance of numerous in financial fields are as follows. First, numerous are also essential for stock market prediction, typically historical stock price or Technical indicators are usually used to predict the future stock price. Second, the numer is an important element in the most uh, financial events and uh, related to financial events and uh, event roles in Table 1. In the bash years event and the reporter's event, time row, share row, and the amount of money row are all in the form of the numer. Tens is a central linguistic phenomenon and a very important dimension of information space. However, prior studies have not paid attention to the numerous information in financial news. Therefore, we propose a novel task called numerous detection in Chinese financial news. From example 1, we can learn that the language of the world differ greatly in whether and how they express tense. Chinese cannot express the tense intuitively at the grammatical level like English and other inflectional languages, and it generally uses adverbs and uh, auxiliary words, which we call tense operators to express the tense. We have collected financial news t um, text, uh, which are rele released by February 20 and 22 in GRG website. The c tense data set has 10,930 instant instances of data. We refer to the tense related knowledge in linguistics and uh, define four categories that is past tense, future tense, static state, and time. This is an example data which in the format of JSON file. In the training site and the test site, the proportion of various tense category is relatively balanced and the distribution of each tense categories in the training site is basically similar to that in the test site. In this paper, we use the robot model as an embedding module without fine training. We conduct experiments employing uh, feed forward neural networks, text convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, and bidirectional long short term memory as baseline models to extract extract features. We use bidirectional long short term memory conditional random field model to conduct a sequence annotation task and extract tense operators as an auxiliary task. In the process of training, 
by RSTM effectively captures the input contextual features. The two tasks share the parameters of the by RSTM layer, which can improve the ability of the model to understand the tense information of the task, so as to improve the performance of the model. The experimental results have listed in Table 5 and Table 6. We can see that Michael F1 is better than Michael F1 for the same model. Table 5 shows the performances of base, baseline models and Table 6 illustrates the performances of the baseline models with numerous encoding respectively. From the table 5 and table 6, we can draw some conclusions. The BIRSTM model architecture is least affected by the uneven data distribution. The tense operator extraction can improve the performance of the model in target numeric tense detection to a certain extent. The multitask Learning with numeral encoding is suitable for the financial numerators detection and can achieve the best performance. Finally, I will make conclusions of the paper. First, this paper proposes a data set CFNAM tense. The CFNAM tense data set provides a better financial text understanding with the high-level numeric tense semantics. Second, we carry out in both baseline models and the multi-task model, and we discuss the results respectively. Third, the presentation of the CFNM tense data set will advance and facilitate the numerators study in financial documents such as market and analysis reports and financial tweets. It can also provide a new study direction for the stock market prediction. The work presented in this paper is supported by the National Key Research and Development Program of China and the grant number 2020AA0108503. Thank you for your attention and I look forward to your questions. Okay, uh, thank you for your presentation. And uh, any questions from participants? Okay, uh, let me ask some questions. I, I, I wonder that uh, what's the uh, intuition to use a numeral encoder in the uh, temp temporal tense detection text? Yeah, because uh, I, I know that. Yeah. Uh, Numeral information uh, occupy a lot of space in a uh, financial document, uh, as many my previous will have mentioned. But uh, I'm not sure the intuition to use like uh, to encode like here seven thousand for for the uh, numeral tens detection because uh, the numeral tens is uh, related to this word, right? is uh, plan two uh, instead of the numeral. So I wonder the intuition to use a numeral encoder for this, this text. Uh. I think the author is here. Uh, yeah. Thank you for your uh, question. Um, um, maybe I I want to mix this uh, numeral encoding from your your from one of your paper. Yeah, I know. Thank you for uh, supporting that in this work. 
but uh, uh, I, I just want to, because uh, the example here, it seems that uh, this numeral is not related to the uh, tens, right? Yeah, so, so, so I wonder the intuition, uh, let me translate. 我想知道你的直觉是什么, uh, let, let me discuss with you later. Okay. Oh, okay. And yeah, thank you. And uh, by the way, I I agree that temporal information is also important in financial documents. So uh, next year we will propose several interest tense also related to temporal information in financial documents. So uh, please join our mail list. I will keep you updated. And uh, thank you for your presentation and answering. So uh, that's. Start next presentation. Hi everyone and welcome to the talk. My name is Somya Sharma and I will be presenting the paper FinRed, a data set for relation extraction in the financial domain. This work has been jointly done by me, Tapas Nayak, Arusarka Bose, Ajay Kumar Meena, Kostav Das Gupta, Niloy Ganguly, and Pavan Gur. It is a joint collaboration between IIT Kharagpur and Goldman Sachs India. In this paper, we tackle the task of relation extraction, which is that given a sentence, the task is to identify triplets from the text, where a triplet is two entities and the relation between the set two entities. So why is a new data set required for the financial domain? A relation extraction model, which has been trained on a source domain, cannot be applied on a different target domain due to the mismatch between the relations. And in this paper, we focus on the relations between financial entities. We have two main contributions. The first is that we released the FinRed data set, which is a financial relation extraction data set, which has been curated from financial news and earning call transfers. And it also contains an annotated test set. The second contribution is that we experiment with various state-of-the-art relation extraction models to create benchmark systems. We use two sources for the FinRed data set. The first is Webhost Financial News, which is a freely available financial data set from Webho's website. It contains 47,851 English financial news articles, which have been crawled from July 2015 to October 2015. The second source is earning call transcripts, which are conference calls during which the management of a particular company announces and discusses the financial updates and the results of the company in the past quarter or year. In total, we collect 4,713 earning call transcripts, which have been dated from July 2019 to September 2019 from seekingalpha.com. The typical format of an earning call transcript consists of a presentation where the company participants speak in monologue, which is followed by a questionnaire, which contains questions from the audience and answers from the company participants. As a pre-processing step, we discard all the questions and we also discard all the monologues, which contain less than 200 characters. In total, we obtain 200,000 monologues, 1.8 million sentences, totaling 152,000 tokens in the call system. Finally, the FinRed dataset cons consists of 7,775 sentences, which have been divided into three dev and steps. In total, there are 29 financial relations and the list of entities and relations have been obtained from the Wikidata knowledge base. Using the distance supervision method, we align the relation triplets from the knowledge base to the sentences in the data. Over here, we can see a comparison between the standard general domain data sets, which is Facebook NYT and WebNLG. In Facebook NYT, out of 24, there are four financial relations. And in Web NLG, out of 216 relations, only 12 are financial relations. In our data set, uh, all of our relations are financial relations, totaling 29. We have 5,699 train sentences, 1,068 test sentences, and the rest form the dev set. 
here we showcase a list of the relations along with the triplet count. So for here, as you can see, for the relation product or material produced, we have total 1,779 triplets. Similarly, we have relations such as headquarter location, owner of, employer, founded by, stock exchange, chief executive officer, etc. We also released an annotated version of the test set where annotation has been done by two native fluent English speakers who remove all the incorrect triplets and go through the data twice. All the triplets are marked as incorrect by both the annotators are removed from the data set. The Cohen Kappa agreement between the annotators is 82.1%. Here are some examples in the data set. So for the sentence, Anthony Jenkins has been sacked as chief executive officer of Barclays PLC. The head entity is Anthony Jenkins. The tail entity is Barclays and the relation is chief executive officer. For the sentence, state owned Mexican oil company Pemex is, rep is reporting second quarter losses of US $5.2 billion due mainly to lower petroleum prices. We obtained two triplets. For the first triplet, the head entity is Pemex the tail entity is petroleum, and the relation between them is product or material produced. For the second triplet, the head entity is Pemex, the tail entity is Mexico City, and the relation is headquarters location. Now we come to some of the experiments that we have conducted on Sindhet data set. We experiment with three baseline state-of-the-art models. Uh, the, I will be explaining them briefly here. For more details, you can go through these citations. The first model is SPN, which is the transformer-based non-autoregressive encoder-decoder model that considers the relation extraction task as a set prediction problem. The second is TP-Linker, which formulates the joint extraction task as a token pair linking problem. And the third is CASREL, which is a BERT-based cascaded binary tagging framework for relation triplet extraction. The metrics that we have used to compare these three methods are precision, recall, and F1 score. Here we showcase the performance of the three baseline models on FinRed dataset. We can observe that when comparing FPNYT and WebNLG datasets with FinRed for the SPN model, there is approximately 4% drop in the F1 score. However, the F1 value, entity F1 value for SPN model is 96.36%, which showcases that SPN can predict the entity correctly. However, the lower F1 scores can be attributed to incorrect relation classification. For TP-Linker and Katzel, we observe a drop of approximately 25 to 30% respectively. The perform in over here, we uh, showcase the entity overlap performance of SPN in particular. And we can observe that the performance improves with the number of triplets in terms of precision, as well as F1 score. We also report the performance on sentence classes with the type of overlapping triplets in them. Based on the overlap of triplets, the sentences can be divided into three types. NEO, which is non-entity overlap, EPO, which is entity pair overlap, and SEO, which is single pair overlap. We can observe that the model uh, showcases a slightly higher performance for SEO and EPO compared to NEO. We believe that this is because the entity prediction part of the model performs well. So for multi-label and overlapping triplets, the performance is higher since it needs to identify less number of entities. So in conclusion, we have proposed the FinRed dataset, which is a relation extraction dataset for financial domain, curated from earning call transcripts and financial news articles. It contains more finance domain specific relations than existing relation extraction datasets. We also experimented with three state-of-the-art joint entity and relation extraction models and observe a significant drop in F1 score when we compare it to general uh, domain then we compare it to general domain relation extraction model. The data set and the earning call transcript, uh, transcript corpus have been released at, at this GitHub link. And with that, I would like to conclude the talk. Thank you for attending.
and I would like to open the panel for any questions that they might have. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your sharing. And uh, any questions? Okay. Uh, if uh, no question, I, I, I have some. Uh, the question is, uh, yes, it's a suggestion that, uh, yeah, be, be, because I try a uh, civil experiment with Bimber and uh, it performed well. So uh, I wonder, have you tried with this Bimber I just shared with uh, pre previous presentations, presenters? Uh, hi. It seems that uh, I can uh, hear you. Okay, may maybe there are some technique problems. But uh, I, uh, what I want to show you, actually what I want to show you is that there are two fingers. And uh, I, I think that maybe uh, you can try the other because you have used uh, earnings, tra earning cost transcription in your uh, data set. And uh, this finger is trained with different data uh, compared with uh, the other finger. This is trained based on news articles. And uh, this is trained with analysis report, earnings conference code, and 10K. So uh, uh, let me show that with you. And uh, maybe it, you can try with that. So uh, above is today's uh, presentations and uh, the accepted paper of this year. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your reply. And, uh, and this year's uh, FinWeb. And uh, let, let me uh, share some uh, information and uh, we also we, we will also announce the best paper award. And uh, so, uh, so uh, thank, thank you very much for uh, joining today's FinWeb workshop again. And uh, also thanks for all authors again for their sharing. Uh, I think this year's FinWeb is still interesting. And uh, now we are going to announce the best paper, and this is selected based on the reviewers' comment. And uh, I I also read read all of your papers, so uh, I think uh, we finally we make that decision. And so the winner is uh, graph representation learning of banking transaction network with uh, edge weighted web enhanced attention and texture information. So uh, congratulations. And uh, I will send some uh, detail and uh, uh, current application with, to you later. So uh, congratulations. And uh, so finally, I want to remind you that uh, every year we organize several events for researchers interested in FinTech duration, especially in uh, the web or uh, NLP. So uh, looking forward to your participation and you can leave your email address to us for updating the news. And uh, additionally, uh, please try to upload the information of your work to this place and feel free to provide suggestions to me. And uh, the more information you provide, the more likely people will see your work, I think, uh, because we have uh, lots of papers every year and it's increased every every year. So uh, you can also add the related work you read to share the information with other researchers. So uh, please try to use this form and uh, we will provide a summarization to recent FinTech tendency in uh, this year in NLP, FIN NLP workshop. So looking forward for your join. And so uh, thank you and uh, see you at other events and next year FinWeb.